In this Warmaster video, the forces of chaos take on the Tomb Kings at 1000 points. And we will be trying out alternate versions of the current army lists. Our battlefield is 120 by 180 centimeters in size, and the terrain is set up to represent the shifting sands of Nehekara. Today's narrative will see the Tomb Kings defending their homeland from an invading Chaos force, with a greater focus on the dice rolls involved to help newer players understand how the game works. Our board features five hills which are open ground and provide infantry and artillery with defended status. There are two woods, they are dense terrain, can only be entered by infantry, block line of sight, but provide defended status. There are four areas of broken ground, they are dense terrain, can only be entered by infantry and provide defended status. Finally, there is one obelisk which is an impassable terrain feature. The game will be played until both sides have had six turns or until one side is forced to withdraw. An army will withdraw once it has lost half of its units or the general is slain. So now let us take a look at the armies which are fighting over this desolate wasteland. The first army in this battle are the forces of chaos. We pick an army to 1000 points and choose 2 units of chaos warriors, 2 units of chaos marauders and 2 units of chaos knights. There is 1 general and 1 sorcerer. 1 unit of knights has the banner of fortune and 1 unit of knights has the sword of might. The army breakpoint is only 3. For this game we're trialling Chaos Knights at the reduced price of 180 points, although limiting their selection to 2 per thousand. This is a compact but very tough army and will be difficult to overcome in close combat. The Chaos Warriors of Nurgle are supported by Chaos Marauders of Nurgle. And likewise, the Chaos Warriors of Zinch are supported by Marauders of Zinch. The Knights of Corn are equipped with the Banner of Fortune, while the Knights of Slanesh have the Sword of Might. The Chaos General is Lord Bale, who will lead from the front with his Command of Nine. And he is assisted by the Chaos Sorcerer, Sindri, whose magic will aid the army in combat. Although small in number, there are no weak links in this Chaos Army, and the overall strategy will be to charge the enemy as quickly as possible. Next we look at the Tomb Kings. This army features 6 units of skeletons, 2 units of skeleton archers, 2 units of cavalry, 1 unit of chariots, a bone giant, 1 Tomb King and a Lich Priest. We've also added two experimental units of infantry to bring the total unit size up to 14. The first new unit will be Tomb Guard, which have the same stats as Grave Guard from the Vampires list. And the second unit are Ushabti, which are a heavy infantry unit with stats identical to Black Orcs. The addition of these two units significantly bolsters the strength of the Tomb King's infantry. So as a balancing factor they are limited to 1 per 1000 points and also take up a chariot slot. Which means at 1000 points, if you take a unit of Tomb Guard and a unit of Ushabti, you only have space left for one unit of chariots. The Tomb King's army is a horde, but with the addition of some decent infantry they should be able to hold their own in close combat. The Tomb Guard front 1 brigade supported by 2 units of skeletons and the Bone Giant can brigade with these units. Meanwhile the Ushabti lead another brigade and they are also supported by two skeletons. These skeleton archer units are also supported by skeleton warriors. Whilst the Mobile Brigade has two units of cavalry and one unit of chariots. The army is led by the Tomb King Rame Tep who is an able commander and can empower his units to fight better in combat. He is assisted by the Lich Priest Atar, whose magic will confound the enemy and bolster the troops. With a breakpoint of 7 this army can sustain a lot of attrition, and their strategy is to overwhelm the chaos with their superior numbers. 
We elect not to use the scouting rules, so do a simple roll-off to determine deployment order. Chaos loses this roll, so must deploy first. They choose to set up all their units in the open ground between two pieces of defendable terrain. The cavalry are placed together on the right, while the infantry holds the centre. This solid block of troops represents a very tough nut to crack. The sorcerer deploys by the knights, and the general takes up position at the rear of the army, ready to issue his first command. The Tomb King now deploys his forces. On the right flank is the Cavalry and Chariot Brigade, with one brigade of archers and infantry, and they will be commanded by Atar. In the centre is a brigade of skeleton archers and warriors, whilst on the left flank are the experimental infantry, supported by skeleton warriors. The Bone Giant joins the far left brigade to hold the flank. These units will all be commanded by Rametep himself. The Tomb King's battle line is much wider than the Chaos Army, so their strategy will be to entice the Chaos to attack their weak centre, whilst their strong flanks envelop the foe and destroy them. With both armies ready, let battle commence. The Tomb Kings take the first turn, and Atar issues the first order of the game. He issues a brigade order to the two units of cavalry and one unit of chariots, which are all touching. We use the optional rule which grants plus one command to a character's first order of the game, so his command rises from eight to nine. He rolls the dice and gets a seven, which is a success. All the units in the brigade now get to make a full pace move of 30 centimeters and in doing so they have now moved out of the command range of ATAR, which is only 20 centimetres. ATAR now switches his command to a different brigade and issues an order to the skeleton archers and skeleton warriors. With command 8 he needs an 8 or less on two dice and succeeds. The infantry brigade makes a full pace move of 20 centimetres and ends its move inside the woods. Satisfied with his handiwork, Atar now issues no further commands and play passes to the Tomb King. Rametep now issues his first order of the game, so his command rises to 10. He orders the Brigade of Archers and Skeleton Warriors, and the order succeeds. They can make a full pace move of up to 20 centimetres and decide to enter the dense terrain. Both infantry brigades which have already moved are now in dense terrain which grants defended status. This means the infantry will only be hit on a 5 plus rather than a 4 plus, and enemies that charge them lose their charge bonus attacks. Rametep now issues a brigade order to the Ushabti and their supporting skeletons. He needs a 9 or less and succeeds. The infantry brigade makes a full pace move 20 centimeters straight forwards. Rametep now switches command to the brigade of Tomb Guard, skeletons, and the Bone Giant. The Bone Giant imposes a minus one command penalty on the Tomb King's order, so his command drops from a nine to an eight. He rolls a six and succeeds. The Brigade makes a full pace move of 20 centimeters straight forwards and lines back up with the Ushabti. Some stands of infantry have crested a hill, so that will grant them defended status against anyone who charges uphill against them. The Tomb King's player issues no further orders with his characters, so he can now move both characters up to 60 centimetres. The Tomb King moves in front of the heavier infantry brigades, ready to command them next turn, whilst the Lich Priest moves in front of the cavalry and chariot brigades, careful to stay within 20 centimetres of all units. After the first turn's movement, the battlefield looks like this. In the shooting phase, Lich Priest Atar attempts to cast his Doom and Despair spell. He needs a 4 plus to succeed and rolls a 5. The Knights of Corn are just in range of the spell, so they are now prevented from charging or pursuing enemies in combat until the start of the Tomb King's next turn. Chaos begin their first turn with Lord Bale making the first order. This is risky, as if the general fails an order, the command phase ends. The Chaos General issues a brigade order to all the infantry units. 
As this is his first order of the game, his command rises from 9 to 10. He rolls a 7 and succeeds. The infantry units make a full pace move straight forwards 20 centimetres. Lord Bale then decides to issue a second order to the same brigade. He gets minus one for the second order and another minus one for the distance of over 20 centimetres. This reduces his command from a nine to a seven. He rolls a four and succeeds. The infantry brigade makes another full pace move straight forwards 20 centimetres and ends up adjacent to the obelisk. Pleased with his progress, Planar passes to Sindri the Sorcerer. Sindri has command 8 which raises to 9 as it's his first order of the game and he orders the Cavalry Brigade. He needs a 9 or less and succeeds. The Cavalry Brigade moves forward and to their left, changing formation as they do so. They are careful to remain within Sindri's command range of 20 centimetres. Sindri then issues a second order to the same brigade. He gets minus 1 command as it is their second order, so his command drops from 8 to 7 and he rolls a 3 and succeeds. The knights continue forwards to the left flank of the Chaos Warrior Brigade to protect their flank. From this position the knights have countered the encroaching undead cavalry and there is now no way for the undead to easily outflank the Chaos Infantry. At the end of the command phase the Chaos characters can now both move up to 60 centimeters and they both reposition ahead of the army. Sindri now attempts to cast the spell Anger of the Gods. He rolls a 4 and succeeds. Hideous booming laughter splits the air as the Chaos Gods take a direct interest in the flow of this battle. All enemy units within 30 centimetres of Sindri will now suffer a minus one to their command. And this should help to slow the advance of the undead, who are completely reliant on orders to move. At the end of Chaos Turn 1 the battlefield now looks like this. The Chaos Army is holding the centre ground with no flanks exposed. How will the undead respond? Tomb King Rametep knows that a frontal assault upon the Chaos Heavy Infantry is unlikely to succeed. Therefore Lich Priest Atar is instructed to send the cavalry division around the Chaos flank to distract their knights away from the main fight. Atar issues a brigade order to the cavalry and chariots. They are within 20 centimetres, but due to the anger of the Chaos Gods, he suffers a minus one command penalty. He needs a seven and succeeds. The cavalry and chariot brigade move forwards and change formation so they're starting to outflank the Chaos Knights. They're also careful to stay within 20 centimetres of Atar, but outside of 30 centimetres of Sindri. Atar now decides whether to launch an attack with his second order or to keep the flank manoeuvre ongoing. We check the flank arc of the nearest unit of Chaos Knights. This shows that the majority of the unit of chariots is actually in the flank of the Chaos Knights. Atar decides to gamble on an attack and issues a second order to the same brigade. He now needs a seven. He gets a four and the order succeeds. We make a charge move with one unit of skeleton cavalry into the Knights of Corn. All charging stands have sufficient move to line up flush against their enemy stands. We then make a charge move with the unit of chariots against the flank of the Knights of Slanesh. All three chariots can fit in against one stand of knights. Perhaps flushed with confidence, Atar also sends in the remaining unit of cavalry against the front of the Knights of Slanesh. Again, all three stands can line up against their opponents, so the Chaos Knights now find themselves engaged on two sides. Because the Skeleton Cavalry bridge the gap between the two units of Knights, this will be one big combat engagement. If the trap works, the Knights of Slanesh should lose several stands as they're pushed back into the engaged Knights of Corn. Play now passes to Tomb King Rame Tep, and he issues a brigade order to the Ushabti and their supporting skeletons. He needs a 9 and succeeds with a roll of 6. The brigade wheels forwards towards their right, staying within the confines of the hill. Happy to leave his infantry in a defended position, Rametep then moves on to the second infantry brigade with the bone giant attached. This time he needs an 8 or less due to the bone giant's negative modifier, and he succeeds. 
the infantry again forms line alongside the Ushabti. The Tomb King is now content to leave the remaining units within their defendable terrain, so the characters reposition up to 60cm ready to issue orders next turn. In the shooting phase, Lich Priest Atar attempts to raise the dead into the combat with the Chaos Knights. He needs a 5 but rolls a 2 so the spell fails. We now move to the combat phase and we pick an undead unit to start fighting against the Chaos unit. The skeleton cavalry fighting the Knights of Corn go first. Each stand has 2 attacks basic, plus 1 for charging, for a total of 9 attacks. They require 4 plus to hit. 4 hits are scored. The Knights make 4 armor saves requiring 4 plus. They save 2 hits. We record 2 hits against the Knights of Corn, then work out the attacks of the skeleton cavalry fighting the Knights of Slanesh. They manage 6 hits on the Knights. The Knights of Slanesh make 3 of their saves, so lose 3 hits. We now work out the attacks of the chariots on the same unit. Chariots have 3 attacks basic, but gain plus 2 attacks when they charge. They also require 4s to hit. We roll 15 dice and score 8 hits. The Knights take their armour saves and pass all but one of them. Due to this incredible good fortune, the Knights of Slanesh have only lost 4 hits in total. The Chaos Knight units can now fight back using their magic items. The Knights of Corn go first, they have 4 attacks each for a total of 12. They score 8 hits so decide not to use the Banner of Fortune. The Undead Cavalry have a save of 5 plus and save 2 hits. 6 hits are recorded against the Cavalry. The Knights of Slanesh can now fight back and they have to fight against the Cavalry to their front. They have 4 attacks per stand, although one stand loses an attack for being flanked by the Chariots. However the Sword of Might grants 1 bonus attack, bringing the total back up to 12. They score 5 hits. With a similar run of luck to the Knights, the Skeleton Cavalry save all but one of these hits. So we record one hit against the Skeleton Cavalry. With all units now having fought, we work out who has won the combat. As neither side can claim any infantry support, whoever has scored the most hits will win. The Undead have scored 6 hits on the Chaos Knights, but the Knights have scored 7 hits on the Undead. This means the Undead have lost the combat by 1 point and must retreat. They also have to remove their casualties first. The first unit of Undead Cavalry has sustained 6 hits which is sufficient to remove 2 whole stands. Once stands have been removed, all units on the losing side retreat. The retreat distance is equal to the difference in combat scores divided by the number of units on the losing side. Fractions are always rounded up to the nearest whole number, so 1 divided by 3 rounds back up to 1. All undead units retreat directly away 1 cm. Any outstanding hits remain on the units until the Chaos player decides what he wants to do. The Chaos player first removes any casualties, and one unit of knights has sustained 4 hits which is sufficient to remove a whole stand. Both Chaos units decide that they are going to pursue the retreating enemy, so all stands are moved directly forwards back into base contact with the enemy. We now fight a second round of combat, with the pursuing Chaos units now gaining plus one attack for pursuit. First, the Knights of Corn attack the single stand of Skeleton Cavalry. They score seven hits. The Cavalry fail all their armor saves, but the remaining stand can only sustain 3 hits as this is all it has to give. The Knights of Slanesh now attack the unit of 3 Skeleton Cavalry stands. They score 7 hits. The Skeleton Cavalry makes 1 save so we record 6 more hits against the unit. In total the Chaos Knights have caused 9 hits to the Skeletons this turn. The remaining Skeletons now fight back with the single stand inflicting 2 hits on the Knights of Corn but they save one. We record one more hit on the Knights of Corn this round. The Skeleton Cavalry now fight back against the Knights of Slanesh and score three hits. The Knights fail two saving throws so we record two more hits against them. The Chariots cannot fight in this second round of combat as they are no longer in base contact with the enemy. 
At the end of the round, the Chaos have scored 9 hits, whilst the Undead have scored 3. The Undead remove casualties first and retreat. They've lost by 6 points, which is divided by 2 for the 2 units which did fight. After casualty removal, there's a single stand of Undead Cavalry remaining, and they retreat 3 centimetres. The Knights of Slanesh decide to pursue the retreating enemy again, but the Knights of Corn decide to fall back in good order. To make a fallback move, the Knights roll 3d6 and can move up to the total distance rolled. They score 11, so move away from the cavalry and towards the chariots, ready for a charge next turn. After two rounds of fighting, the combat phase now ends. Any units which are still engaged will keep any hits which they have sustained. In this case, both the Chaos Knights and Skeleton Cavalry have outstanding hits, which are marked on their units. However, the Knights of Corn are no longer engaged, and as they did not sustain sufficient hits to remove a whole stand, all outstanding hits are removed. So at the end of Undead Turn 2, the battlefield looks like this. The Undead flank attack seems to have failed, and the Chaos are now ready to strike back. This turn, the Undead have lost one whole unit of cavalry and two out of three stands from a unit of cavalry, which equates to one and a half points towards their breakpoint and awards the Chaos player with 90 victory points. Meanwhile, the Chaos army has only lost a single stand of knights, which counts nothing towards their breakpoint and awards the Undead with no victory points. Chaos begin turn 2 in a very strong position, with one unit of knights engaged and the other ready to charge. The Chaos Knights can use their initiative to charge the closest visible enemy unit, which are the Chariots. They move all three bases into contact with the enemy, although the presence of the Knights of Slanesh prevent them from forming a flush battle line. The Chariots make three stand and shoot attacks as the Knights charge home, scoring two hits. The Knights fail both their saves, so two hits will be carried over into the first round of combat. The Chaos Army now moves to ordered movement, with General Bale ordering the Infantry Brigade. Although his command is 9, the nearby presence of enemy troops reduces this to an 8. He rolls a 9 and fails. However, as the Brigade has failed to receive its first order, it's still permitted a half-pace move with all units able to move 10 centimetres. The Brigade makes a half-pace move to their right to close the gap to the Tomb King's infantry. As the General has failed an order, the command phase now ends, so all that is left to do is for the Chaos characters to move up to 60 centimetres. Lord Bale moves closer to the infantry, while Sindri heads forward ready to cast a spell. In the shooting phase, Sindri once again calls forth the anger of the Chaos Gods, but this time they're not listening. We now move to the combat phase with the charge of the Knights of Corn into the chariots. They have 15 attacks on the charge and score 7 hits. They decide not to use their Banner of Fortune. The chariots take 7 saves and succeed with 4. They have sustained only 3 hits. The chariots now fight back with their 9 attacks and score 4 hits. The Knights, however, pass 3 out of 4 saves, so only sustain one more. At the end of this round, it's 3 hits apiece, so the combat is a draw. Both units must now fall back in good order, so we roll a dice to see which moves first. On a 4+, plus, it will be the Chaos side. We roll a 5, so the Knights move. As the Knights have sustained 3 hits, this is not enough to remove a whole stand. We roll 3d6 and score 15. The knights choose to fall back directly away from the chariots and towards their own infantry. Meanwhile the chariots have also sustained three hits and this is enough to remove a whole stand. The surviving two stands then make their own fallback move and roll 17. The chariots move sideways towards the knights trying to set up a flank charge for next turn. However when moving the chariots we forget a very important rule. When you fall back in good order, you're not allowed to move forwards of the line of combat, which the chariots have ended up doing. We will have to see if this has any bearing on the game to come. We now move to the combat between the Knights of Slanesh and the Skeleton Cavalry. As the Knights are pursuing a distance of 3 centimetres, they gain plus 2 attacks per stand. They score 9 hits, and the Cavalry fails all their saves, but can only sustain 2 more hits. 
In return, the skeletons cause one more hit on the knights, which they fail to save. The skeletons are wiped out, which means the Chaos Knights automatically win the combat. The Slanesh Knights now make a fallback move themselves and score 13. They reposition next to the Knights of Corn to form a brigade again. So somewhat embarrassingly, Corn's finest have failed to overcome the enemy chariots, whilst the favoured of Slanesh have mopped up the enemy cavalry. As no units are now engaged in combat, all outstanding hits are removed. As the Tomb King's cavalry gambit has failed, in their turn 3 they decide to switch tactics. Undead units cannot use initiative, and the chariots are now out of command range from the Lich Priest, so only the Tomb King will be able to command them this turn. However, Tomb King Rame Tep has greater plans in mind. He has noticed that the Chaos Infantry is now just within charge range of his Tomb Guard. He issues a brigade order to the Tomb Guard, their supporting infantry and the Bone Giant requiring an 8. He gets a 7 and succeeds. The Tomb Guard make their charge move first, moving the closest stand against the closest enemy stand. The remaining stands then form up, with the final stand having insufficient move to form a battle line, so they go in support. The Bone Giant does have sufficient move to go around the terrain and contact the corner of the Chaos Warriors, who count as a pinned target. One unit of skeletons then moves up to support the Tomb Guard, whilst the final unit of skeletons occupies the dense terrain. The Tomb King now attempts to order the brigade with the Ushabti down off the hill to join the fight, but he fails with a roll of 10. The Ushabti brigade decides not to make a half-paced move, and remains in a defended position on the hill. At the end of the command phase, the characters now move up to 60cm, and they both decide to move closer to the melee in the middle of the board. This clash could go either way, but the Tomb King hopes that the attacks of the Bone Giant will be sufficient to swing the combat in his favour. In the shooting phase, the Chariots make two shots at the Chaos Knights of Corn and score one hit. The Knights fail their armour save, and we record one hit against them. Atar now attempts to raise the dead into the combat in the centre. He needs a 5, but rolls a 2. At the end of the shooting phase we work out the drive-back effects of the bow fire from the chariots into the Knights of Corn. As they have sustained one shooting hit, they are driven back 1d6 centimetres directly away from the chariots. We roll a 2. The Knights are moved 2 centimetres and the corner of their base clips into the Knights of Slanesh. The Slanesh Knights make way to the side to allow the Corn Knights to pass by them, and both units now have to test for confusion. Fortunately, neither is confused. We now move to the combat phase, and Tomb King Rame Tep unleashes his special ability. Ancient spirits of evil, transform this decayed form to Mumra! Every stand in the unit of Tomb Guard will now receive plus one attack for the entire combat phase. The newly boosted Tomb Guard roll ten attack dice and score eight hits. The Warriors of Nurgle make eight saves and succeed in four of them. We mark four hits on the unit. The Bone Giant then attacks and scores another four hits. And the Chaos Warriors make two more saves, so sustain two more hits. Three stands of Chaos Warriors now fight back against the Tomb Guard, and one stand loses one attack due to the terror of the Bone Giant. They make 11 attacks and score 6 hits. The Tomb Guard take their 5 plus saves and only save one hit. So we now record 5 hits on the Tomb Guard. The Undead have scored 6 hits on the Chaos and have 2 stands in support, for a total of 8. Meanwhile the Chaos have only scored 5 hits, but can call on 4 stands in support, bringing their total to 9. The Undead have lost combat by 1 point and must retreat. The retreat distance is 1cm. 
As the Tomb Guard have sustained 5 hits, this is enough to remove an entire stand and carry 2 hits over. The Undead remove their casualties and then all units in the combat retreat 1cm. The Chaos units now decide to pursue. The Warriors of Nurgle have sustained 6 hits which is sufficient to remove an entire stand and carry 2 hits over. The surviving stands now move directly forward so they're back in base to base contact with the Tomb Guard. The Marauders of Nurgle now make a supporting pursuit behind the Warriors of Nurgle, whilst the Warriors of Zinch can make an indirect pursuit into the flank of the Tomb Guard and their skeleton support. By outflanking the enemy in this manner, the Chaos Unit should force the Undead to retreat into each other next round. In the second round of combat, the Chaos Warriors roll their pursuit attacks against the Tomb Guard and score an impressive 12 hits. The Tomb Guard make 4 saves, but as they only have 4 hits left on the unit, that's how many they sustain. One stand of Chaos Warriors now make their pursuit attacks against the Skeletons. They score 2 hits, but the Skeletons save 1, so the unit only sustains 1 hit. The Tomb Guard now fight back against the Chaos Warriors and score 4 hits from 7 attacks. The Warriors make 2 saves, so we add 2 more hits to their total. The Bone Giant then attacks the same unit of Warriors and scores 3 hits, and they save 1. 2 more hits are added to the Warriors this round, bringing their total to 4. Finally, the Skeleton Warriors get to make their attacks, but miss. At the end of the round, the Chaos have scored 5 hits and have 3 stands in support for a total of 8, whilst the Undead have managed 4 hits but have no stands in support. The Undead lose the combat by 4 points, which is divided by 3 fighting units and rounded up to a retreat distance of 2cm. The Undead now remove casualties, with the Tomb Guard being completely wiped out. The Skeletons have two stands in their flank and one stand in their front, so they must retreat from the flanking unit. Meanwhile the Bone Giant has one stand in its front, so it must retreat from the unit to its front. This will cause the retreating units to collide with each other. We decide to move the Skeletons first. The Skeleton stand, which is being flanked by two stands of Chaos Warriors, can retreat 2cm freely. The central stand, however, is blocked by the Bone Giant, so will be destroyed. This will leave the third stand out of formation, which automatically destroys it also. Once the dust has settled, the skeleton unit looks like this. Meanwhile, the Bone Giant now has a clear path to retreat. The Chaos Warriors of Zeech decide to pursue into the flank of the skeletons once again, whilst the Warriors and Marauders of Nurgle decide to fall back in good order. They roll a 7 for their fallback move, and rejoin the Marauders of Zeech, who took no part in the combat. At the end of Undead Turn 3, the battlefield now looks like this. The Undead have now lost two units of cavalry and a unit of Tomb Guard, with the unit of Skeletons reduced to a single stand. Meanwhile Chaos have lost two stands from a unit of Chaos Warriors. The Chaos Army is now in a good position to capitalise on the failure of the Undead attack. At the start of their third turn, the Chaos Knights decide to use their initiative to charge the Skeleton Chariots. The Knights of Korn go first and charge into the front of the Chariots, who stand and shoot, scoring two hits. The Knights fail both their saves, so we record two hits against them. Next, the Knights of Slanesh charge in for corner to corner contact as the chariots are now a pinned target. We now move to ordered movement and Sindri gives an order to the Marauders of Zinch, needing a 7. He rolls a 3 and succeeds. The Marauders move up into a supporting position alongside the Warriors fighting the Skeletons. Play now passes to Lord Bale who issues an order to the Marauders of Nurgle. He needs an 8 and rolls a 3. The second unit of Marauders also moves into a supporting position alongside the Warriors of Zinch. Lord Bale then attempts to order the single stand of Warriors of Nurgle. He gets minus 2 for the two missing stands, minus 1 for the presence of nearby enemy, and minus 1 as they're over 20 centimetres. This reduces his command from a 9 to a 5. He rolls a 10 and fails. As this is the unit's first order of the turn, they can still make a half-paced move, so they back off 10cm. 
By adding two extra units into the combat against the skeletons, the Chaos player now has three units which can make an advance move once the skeletons are destroyed. This gives the Chaos player the option to advance into the flank of the Bone Giant or seek other targets elsewhere. The Chaos Command phase now ends with the failure of Lord Bale's order and both Chaos characters now reposition up to 60cm. In the shooting phase Sindri attempts to summon the Rage of Chaos but the spell fails. Moving to combat the Knights of Khorne charge into the Skeleton Chariots. They have 15 attacks and score 7 hits. The Chariots make 4 saves. The Knights of Slanesh then add their attacks. They score 4 hits and the Chariots save 2. In total the Chariots have sustained 5 hits. The Chariots now make their attacks back against the Knights of Khorne. They have 6 attacks and score 4 hits. The Knights fail 2 saves so take 2 more hits. At the end of the round the Chariots have scored 4 hits on the Knights of Khorne whilst the Knights have scored 5 hits against the Chariots. We remove casualties with both the Knights and the Chariots losing a stand. The Chariots then retreat from the Knights of Khorne by 1cm and are pursued by both the Knights of Khorne and the Knights of Slanesh who wrap around their flank. In the ensuing combat the final Chariot is wiped out for no damage to the Knights. Both units now fall back in good order, we make one roll and score 10. Both units can now move 10 centimetres. Both units of knights form up in line, ready to face the action. Moving to the combat between the warriors and the skeletons, the warriors inflict 4 hits on the skeletons who fail to save. The skeletons also fail to cause any damage to the warriors before they are wiped out. The warriors of Zinch then make an advance move into the waiting bone giant. However this now blocks the line of sight from the Marauders to the Bone Giant so they will have to pick another target. The Chaos General now sends a unit of Marauders advancing into the Ushabti on the hill displacing the Tomb King in the process. The Marauders are unlikely to win this combat but his hope is that this will draw the Ushabti out of their defended position. Meanwhile the Marauders of Nurgle now have no viable targets to advance into so they fall back in good order. With a roll of 10 they form column and contact the priest Atar behind them. This forces Lich Priest Atar to join a friendly unit within 30 centimetres so he enters the rocky terrain to join the skeletons. We now move to the combat between the warriors of Zinch and the bone giant. If they can push him back into the dense terrain he will be destroyed as he cannot enter the rocky ground. We use the optional rule on the chaos warriors which grants them a charge bonus because they wiped out their previous opponents in one round. This is countered by the terror of the bone giant so they have 12 attacks. 5 hits are scored. But the bone giant saves 4 of them. The bone giant fights back and scores 2 hits on the warriors and they save 1. With no infantry support this combat has ended in a draw with 1 hit apiece. We roll to see which unit must fall back first and on a 4 plus it will be the chaos. We get a 5. The warriors fall back 13 centimetres protecting their flanks from the bone giant. And then the bone giant falls back 10 centimetres setting up a charge for next turn. We now move to the combat between the advancing marauders and the defended Ushabti. The marauders get 9 attacks requiring 5s to hit and score 2 hits. The Ushabti fail their 5 up saves so we record 2 hits against them. The Ushabti now fight back with 12 attacks and score 5 hits. The Marauders make one save. The Marauders get a total of two for the hits they caused whilst the Ushabti score four for the hits plus three support for a total of seven. The Marauders have lost combat by five and must retreat five centimetres. They lose one stand and carry one hit over. The Ushabti then pursue them and bring a unit of skeletons in support. In the second round because they pursued more than three centimetres the Ushabti get plus two attacks per stand. They score 12 hits. The Marauders make 3 saves so they suffer 5 outstanding hits which is all they have to give. The 2 Marauder stands now fight back and score 4 hits on the Ushabti. They make 2 saves so take 2 hits. We mark the additional hits on both units and as the Marauders have now suffered sufficient hits to kill all their stands they are removed. Meanwhile the Ushabti have taken 4 hits which is sufficient to remove one of their stands. As they have wiped out their opponents the victorious Ushabti can make an advance move themselves. 
and the Tomb King player has noted that the Ushabti are now in the flank arc of the Warriors of Zeech. The two stands of Ushabti make an advanced move into the Warriors flank, getting one stand in contact and one in support. The Ushabti also contact the Sorcerer Sindri who will now have to join a friendly unit within 30cm. The Skeleton Warriors are dragged into support with the Ushabti and Sindri decides to join the Knights of Slanesh nearby. The Ushabti can now fight up to two rounds of combat against the Warriors. They have four attacks as their advance move came after two previous rounds of combat. They only score one hit and the Chaos Warriors save it. In reply the Chaos Warriors can only make three attacks as they've been outflanked. They score two hits and the Ushabti save one. The Chaos Warriors score one for their hit whilst the Ushabti scored no hits but do have two stands in support. This means the Ushabti win combat by one and the Warriors must retreat. The Ushabti then make a pursuit move and only keep one stand in contact with the Warriors to minimise attacks back. They do however reposition the supporting skeletons to bring another stand into support. We now fight a second round of combat with the Ushabti gaining five attacks for pursuit and scoring three hits. The Chaos Warriors save one, so we mark two more hits on them. The Chaos Warriors then fight back against the Ushabti with three attacks and score two hits. The Ushabti save one, so they suffer one more hit. This round the Ushabti have scored two hits and three support for a total of five, whilst the Chaos Warriors have only managed one hit. The Chaos Warriors have lost combat by four, so retreat four centimetres, and the Ushabti once again pursue. We mark the outstanding hits on both units, with the tenacious Chaos Warriors not yet losing a stand. After two rounds of combat, the units are still engaged, and the combat phase now ends. So at the end of turn 3, the Undead have now lost 5 units towards their breakpoint of 7, giving the Chaos a total of 260 victory points. Meanwhile the Chaos have lost 1.5 units towards their breakpoint of 3, granting the Undead 100 victory points. The Tomb Kings begin turn 4 with Atar ordering the Bone Giant to charge into the engaged warriors of Zinch. The order succeeds and the massive construct charges into contact with the beleaguered warriors. If the undead can remove this unit as a threat they stand a good chance of breaking the Chaos Army. Next the Tomb King orders the single unit of skeletons on the hill but he fails with a roll of 10. These skeletons decide not to make a half pace move and remain where they are, out of sight from the Chaos Army. As the general has failed an order the command phase comes to an end and the characters can now move up to 60 centimetres. Both characters move closer to the central fight. In the shooting phase Atar once again attempts to raise the dead into combat but fails the casting roll. We now move to combat with the Ushabti going first against the Warriors of Chaos. They gain plus two attacks for their pursuit distance, but can only score one hit. The Chaos Warriors fail their save, so we mark one more hit on their stands. Next is the Bone Giant, he has eight attacks and scores four hits. The Chaos Warriors pass two saves, so we mark two more hits on their stands. The Chaos Warriors now fight back and must strike against the Bone Giant to their front. They only score a single hit which the Bone Giant saves. The Chaos Warriors can claim one for support, whilst the Tomb Kings have scored three hits and claimed two support for a total of five. The Chaos Warriors remove casualties and must retreat. As they have one stand in their front and one in their flank, they can choose which direction to retreat. They retreat sideways. The Bone Giant pursues first, and it's an indirect pursuit as he has no stands directly in front of him. We work out the position as for a charge, and the Bone Giant is actually still in the unit's front, so pursues back into front contact. The Ushabti then make their pursuit straight forwards back into the flank of the warriors, and again they keep one stand in contact and two in support. The pursuing units get plus two attacks for the pursuit distance and the Bone Giant goes first getting four hits, but the warriors save three. The Ushabti go next and score four hits and the warriors fail all their saves. The warriors then fight back against the Bone Giant and score two hits which he fails to save. At the end of the second round, the Warriors can claim 3 for combat resolution, whilst the Undead can claim 7. The Warriors lose combat again and must remove casualties, but a single stand of Warriors remains with one hit left. The Bone Giant elects to pursue the retreating Warriors and moves back into front contact. 
Meanwhile, the Ushabtian skeletons fall back in good order and line up to face the Marauders. The engaged units retain their outstanding hits, whilst the unengaged units now discount any outstanding hits. After two rounds, the combat will now end, so the epic fight between the Bone Giants and Warriors of Zeech must continue next turn. Meanwhile, the Ushabti will have to face off against the Marauders of Nurgle next round, as well as the encroaching knights on the horizon. At the end of the turn, the battlefield now looks like this, with both armies teetering close to their respective breakpoints. The Chaos have now lost one whole unit of infantry and two half units of infantry, earning the undead 200 victory points. Meanwhile, the undead are still 5 out of 7 units broken, with the Chaos sitting on 320 victory points. If the Chaos Army can kill off two undead units this turn without losing another unit of their own, they will force the enemy to withdraw. They begin with the single stand of Nurgle Warriors using their initiative to evade away from the Bone Giant. Meanwhile the Marauders of Nurgle decide not to use their initiative and instead are given an order by Sindri. The order succeeds on a 6 and the Marauders are moved into a supporting position behind the Warriors of Zeench. This is a tactical move, as the Marauders will now add two supports to the combat, whereas the Bone Giant can only inflict one hit on the Warriors of Zeech. Play now passes to Lord Bale, and he issues an order to the two units of Chaos Knights, both missing a stand. The order succeeds on a double one, and both units can make a charge move against the Ushabti. The Knights of Khorne go first and form a battle line, followed by the Knights of Slanesh. Them limb from limb. This charge is not without risk however, as if either of the Chaos Knight units lose a single stand this round, the Chaos Army may be forced to withdraw. To tip the odds in their favour, both Chaos characters now join respective units fighting in combat. Sindri joins the Knights of Slanesh, whilst Bale joins the Marauders of Nurgle. The move by Lord Bale is another tactical one, as he knows the Chaos units are bound to win against the Bone Giant, and his intention is to set up an advantageous advance. We now move to the shooting phase and Sindri unleashes the Boon of Chaos to bolster the attacks of his unit. He needs a 4 and succeeds. Each stand of Slanesh Knights, plus Sindri himself, gains a bonus attack. The Chaos player decides to work out the combat between the Bone Giant and the infantry first, with the Bone Giant easily removing the last hit from the Warriors. The Warriors fail to cause any damage in return, but as the Bone Giant could only cause one hit to the Warriors, and the Marauders provide two support, the Chaos side wins. The last stand of Warriors of Zeech is removed as a casualty, and then the Bone Giant retreats. The Marauders then make a pursuit move against the Bone Giant, and manage to lap around it on three sides. And Lord Bale now gets to fight alongside his men. The forces of chaos call for your destruction! The Marauders plus Lord Bale score 7 hits on the Bone Giant and he only makes one save, so we record 2 more hits. In response, the Bone Giant gets 3 hits on the Marauders, but they save one, so we record 2 on them. The Bone Giant has lost all its hits, so he is brought crashing down. And the Marauders can now make an advance move into the flank of the Ushabti. If the Chaos units can get rid of the Ushabti, then the Undead will withdraw. The Knights of Khorne go first and they score 5 out of 10 hits. They decide to use the Banner of Fortune to reroll all their attacks and score 5 hits. The Ushabti make 2 saves so we record 3 hits against them. The magically bolstered Knights of Slanesh plus Sindri go next and they score 7 hits but the Ushabti save 4 of these, so they only suffer 3 more hits. It's now down to the single stand of Marauders led by Lord Bale to finish the job. Take me to them, that I may render judgement. The Marauders miss their attacks, but Lord Bale hits twice, and the Ushabti fail their saves. We mark 8 hits on the unit, which will be sufficient to destroy them. But the combat is not done yet. 
Both stands of Ushabti can strike against the Knights of Khorne, and if they can kill off a single stand, then the Chaos Army will also be forced to withdraw. The Ushabti make 7 attacks and score 5 hits, but the Knight's armour holds true and they only suffer a single hit. With all dice now rolled, we add infantry support and the Chaos have won this combat 10 points to 2. As they have lost, the Undead remove casualties first and the Ushabti bring the army to its breakpoint. The Undead army withdraws, ceding the field to the forces of Chaos. Rametep orders the retreat and the surviving Tomb King's units return to their necropolis. Meanwhile Lord Bale collects a mountain of skulls for the Skull Throne. As the game has ended we now calculate victory points to determine who has won. The Tomb Kings killed one unit of Marauders and one and a half units of Warriors for a total of 270 victory points. Meanwhile the Warriors of Chaos killed off one unit of Skeletons, one unit of Tomb Guard, two units of Cavalry, one unit of Chariots, one unit of Ushabti and the Bone Giant. They score 540 victory points. Although this battle ended in a decisive victory for the Chaos player, the Tomb Kings acquitted themselves well despite the failure of their cavalry push and their infantry attack. And in the final turn the Tomb Kings still had a chance of forcing a draw by destroying another stand of Chaos Knights. The experimental infantry for the Tomb Kings acquitted themselves well, but ultimately they were no match for the might of Chaos. The tactical gambles employed by the Chaos side paid off, as the Ushabti were lured out of a defendable position and ultimately cut down. Why not try out the experimental Tomb Kings units for yourself, and let us know how they fare in your battles by posting your results on the Experimental Rules Forum.